Welcome to Journey Through the Gate, your paranormal portal podcast, as we delve into the many questions and wonders brought on by the supernatural experience. What's on the other side of the gate? Let's find out together. Welcome to this side of the gate. And tonight I have somebody that has been in podcasting and radio for a well over eight years. He is juggling a lot of paranormal balls in the air here. He has got the Paratruth Radio with his co-host Eric. He has just launched Beyond Reason, where they dare you to have an open mind. And it is my friend, Justin Cancellari. Welcome to this side of the gate, Justin. Well, I commend you for saying my last name right. <laughs> hey, I have been practicing for two days. <laughs> and that's you wouldn't funny. believe the pronunciations I get, so <laughs> congratulations to you. Thank you. That's the, that, that's the only thing I wanted to have to do right on this show tonight. So there we go. We got that out. <laughs> we got that out. That's awesome. Oh, I feel so much better. So that's great. You know, we've had all this time in this, and I think... Let's take, if you don't mind, uh, Paratruth Radio for a second, because I think it's a great concept, because in order to have that kind of blend, because, um, you know, Eric comes from uh, kind of, I don't want to say, st- let's say, not strict Christian uh, views. I always say fundamentalist. Okay, perfect. Christian. And then you have a little bit, you're... you're you know, a little bit different on that side, but it always flows well on that show. I just think it's wonderful that two people can sit down and just speak their views. You know, you see so much rivalry in this and why I don't know, you know, in the paranormal, you know, there is the paranormal unity. That's just, you know, a pipe dream, I think in some ways, but I just like the way that show flows. How did you guys come together on that? Uh, well, it was actually a merging of two shows that we had separately. Uh, we originally started with Night Stalkers Radio back in 2008, November of 2008. So it's actually, I kind of just realized, been almost 10 years since I've been doing this um, with a, a small break in between. But uh, he ended up having his own show and I had my own show because we ended up splitting. Um, he had forgotten truth radio. I had parasite radio. And when we decided to merge the two, uh, ideals together for the new show, we just kind of merged the names together. Mm -hmm. And the idea for paratruth radio was because when we first started night stalkers, it was, Eric was a, born and raised Roman Catholic, but he really was not a practicing, I guess what you would call Catholic. And I had kind of fell away from Christianity because I had a lot of stuff in my life where it's like, why would a God, a supposed forgiving God, Mm -hmm. give me this shitty life (laughs) if, if he's so forgiving and he's so like, you know, so yeah. I had fell away from my faith, but we ended up um, kind of talking a lot about paranormal type stuff like werewolves, vampires, ghosts. We had gotten into the ghost hunters craze back when. And, you know, I had thought to myself, gosh, there's got to be a way for us to do like some type of show on this, like maybe online radio or something. And at that point I had never heard the word podcast. I'm not sure very many people had even in 2008, it's kind of boomed even more so than back then. And so I had looked up how to do it and I'm like, all right, we're going to go with this. And when we came back to Christianity, he had went with both feet in like he was very strong in in his faith and it was causing some 
friction between us when it came to Night Soccer's radio because he would, for a lack of the better word, attack some guests Uh-oh. if they were coming from a certain perspective. Like we had uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley on. And she is a a known medium as well as a great author. And he wanted to use faith on her. And I could tell just by her reaction to some of his questions that he was rubbing her the wrong way. So after a couple of other guests like that, um, you know, I, I had moved to North Dakota and we were doing the show from separate locations and I ended up having an opportunity to go on to another network. And I was like, okay, you know what? Sorry to do this, but I have to go. And he was upset for good reason. But, uh, I I think that's the best thing that could have happened because when he started forgotten truth radio, I, I, I don't know how it happened, but, he became much more open-minded and a lot of people that were listening to him on forgotten truth were people who were Wiccan witchcraft, Mm -hmm. pagan backgrounds, and actually somebody that was a faithful listener to not just his show, but several shows on the network told him, thank you so much for being the first Christian to Put stuff out there, but not downgrade paganism. Right, right. And yeah. so I, I think that had to happen for us to do Pear Truth Radio because now we can meld two two sides of the puzzle, and it it's not a well you, you know the Bible says this. Well, you know what science says this, or mm-hmm. mediumship says this. So it's I think it's a good uh, it's a good melding. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, is Eric does rely a lot on science. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people in in Christianity who would say that science is wrong and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that he he has grown so much Mm -hmm. in in the past couple of years. Yeah, and it sounds like you all kind of grew together in a way. You grew apart and then came together, and you know you had to go off and grow, you know. And then he came together, and it's now it's a good fit because I just got done listening to the whole series of Angels and Demons. I mean, they all had different names, but they all went together. You did like a mm-hmm. solid series, let's say a mini series of this, and I thought it was very well done. And I highly recommend anybody that wants to get a good view of both sides. I mean, obviously Eric was coming back with all of the, you know, the theology end of it, you know, um, and then you had some of yours too, but I thought it was well put together. You kind of gave a lot of different views, not just two, you know, you really did. And I think you worked hard on that. And I thought it was very interesting. It was very well done. Um, And it really showed what you just explained it, you know, now that's, how you got to that and that's that's yeah. wonderful so if that's the way it happened fantastic and now you've started beyond reason and your whole mantra is you know dare to have an open mind and i've heard you interview now this one you do primarily by yourself and you're interviewing guests and right um you know you have a lot of different a, a wide spectrum of guests you're not just to, to playing it safe where you're bringing in people that might have your same view you're in you know right i like that you know um and it's a and it and it's usually a great it's around an hour sometimes a little more but it's it's a fast hour you know i like the yeah. questions you ask you're talking you're not just talking at them you're you're listening to their to their answers and it's good because you think but you could take something like that for granted. You figure every podcast is the same, um, and it's not. Not even some of the large radio shows that are very famous right now. You're just not getting a lot of that in some. So, you know, that's terrific. And on top of that, you're writing sci-fi books. You have at least one out there and a lot of short stories. Do you not? Yeah. I uh, actually am working on book two in the series. And uh, actually, Eric and I have 
just decided to do a a nonfiction book about uh, ghost hunting, even though I I. I we were just on with uh, Brian Bowden on Inside the Goblin Universe, mm-hmm. and he had made the comment, I don't like that term. And to me as well, I, ghost hunting is, is such a ridiculous term, but it was coined <laughs> when ghost hunters mm-hmm. started. And, and that's how people associate paranormal investigator because people hear paranormal investigator and they're like, oh, well, what what do you do then? Mm-hmm. And, I hunt ghosts. Yeah. That, that, that's really yeah. right. <laughs> it's absolutely true. And it, and really, I mean, Hans Holzer, you know, his first, one of his, I think it was his third book was Ghost Hunter. And before that, it was Price. He called himself a ghost hunter. And that was what, 20, 1928, 1930s, somewhere around in there. So, I mean, mm-hmm. it's a term, it's a legit term. It just depends on what you view when you hear it. You know, do you see that? para reality show that was on for 10 years ghost hunters or do you see some you know what do you see so right you know you can make it your own and it's a totally legit term although like i agree with you in a lot of ways i i it it's it's more like you know stomping through the forest what are you doing i'm hunting ghosts you know <laughs> like <I'm her> fun <laughs> or something you know but um yeah and some people just have that ability to where they just stand in one place and the ghosts come to them so it's just it's this paranormal world the paranormal the supernatural the uncanny all of it you know um it always seems to me we love a good unsolved mystery everybody wants you know most people like a good mystery no matter what the subject might be and the paranormal world, supernatural world, all of this, you bring in everything from aliens, you name it, all in one big thing. It's like one big unsolved mystery with a lot of little parts in it. So mm-hmm. who doesn't like, you know, investigating that, whether it's talking to people that have done it or going out there in the field themselves, and everybody's got a different way to do it. And I don't know that any one way is better than the other, if you know what I mean. I mean, there's obvious right. ways to do things with certain equipment and others. I know a lot of people that are old school. You just had Dan Baldwin on great interview, by the way, on um, Mm -hmm. beyond reason. He does it with a, with his own ability and a pendulum, you know, and I know people like Mark Nesbitt and people that have been in this forever that do dousing rods. And then some people have thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And then some people do all that together. So it's amazing. It's amazing. Absolutely. It's an amazing subject, you know, and when you start bringing, that's how you start bringing science meets, you know, the, the kind of the supernatural, the feelings, the, you know, the very natural, you know, your intuition and things like that together. Do you find, what I wanted to ask you, you said that you were, you were into that whole thing where you started watching Ghost Hunters and I think there wasn't that many shows on at the time. If you look back in my time, and I'm much older than you are we had I am. <laughs> we had sightings. We had maybe in search of, you know, and you got real lucky around October there might be a thing on a whole show on ghosts, you know, where they tell the story and they go through and you might have, you know, whoever on um some unsolved mysteries. And then all of a sudden there was this a little bit trickling in and ghost hunters and then boom, everything went full tilt boogie. Right, yeah. In your time um, we've got your para reality shows that we know that <laughs> for the most part aren't very real. <laughs> and then you have some other more in-depth ones that are getting a little different now. I see that they're starting to bring a little bit of mediumship or maybe something like that in with the tech. How do you perceive the changes over the past 20 years in a paranormal world? Uh, it's actually come... I, I mean, one thing that I've said several times is paranormal has become the new normal. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, we've I've loved seeing the uh, evolution of the different equipment. Mm-hmm. I've loved seeing the. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I am not up to date on the TV shows. I've loved seeing the podcasts mm-hmm. that have come up and 
I think that the podcast is is the way to go or even coast to coast AM, you know, Midnight in the Desert, who is that's done by Dave Schroeder now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's really where it's at. When you when you say reality TV, my brain kind of shuts off and I, <laughs> I do watch a show or two of reality TV with my wife because she, she enjoys a couple of, of shows, but it's one of those ones where you can watch it and just shut your brain off. And you're like, this isn't reality. Yeah. Why are we calling this reality I TV? I know. I get it, man. <laughs> I totally get it. And I've watched it, you know, just come through so quick, you know, where they'll try a different thing. And I'm like, how is this different? It's it's just, it's five more people going through. I always look at it like, um, I'm getting to take tours of places I wouldn't normally get to see. I love the history. If it's got any kind of history based fact on it, here's the story of this place. You know, this is what's going on, but it's not doing the same as say you're older in search of where they gave you the, the, the history of the town and the, the, the place and the story behind it. And then maybe brought someone in at the end. Basically it's an hour of people walking around with equipment saying, did you hear that? And then playing it back and then playing it back, you know, or, you know, my husband will always walk through and go, something touched me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, that's what it is. And it's just like we've been, I think we've been fed that for too long and people are starting to ask for more. I honestly like the stuff that's come out of Canada, things like ghostly encounters where they just have the people talking and then they do a reenactment and then they come and they give different views on what they thought happened and basically leave it up to you. That's kind of cool. I, 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 I've liked those. Um, I think when they started taking the feeling out of it, it just got techie kind of crazy, you know, but I have enjoyed the yeah. equipment. I've, I've enjoyed seeing the new stuff that's come out. There's some I can't stand. I hate that white noise thing. I don't care how many people like it. I'm sorry. It makes me n- nuts. The radio that goes through and then you the hear ghost boxes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. And that's just because of the staticky sound, you know? It's like, I, I just can't handle that. It's not that I don't believe in what it's doing or I don't even understand it. I want to understand what I'm using because I can't Right, tell. well, I yeah. just had a guest on who has modified the ghost box and she calls it a portal where it eliminates that white noise. Well, that might be different then. It's just the, yeah, the white and, noise and, I can't stand, you know. Right, and do you know who Chris Moon is? Sounds familiar. I can't say I know. Uh, he kind of inherited the radio to the dead from, um, oh, what's his name? It's not Huff. It's escaping. It's escaping me. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> but he, he, uh, has the radio to the dead and actually uses a, a, a receiver similar to that, um, I, I wish I could remember the guy, the inventor's name, but the inventor had originally invented it for for that white noise, mm-hmm. so that there could be some type of spirit communication. Right, so they could use that basically to to come through. I think that's extremely interesting. I um, there was another uh, John uh, Tenney, who's been in this forever. and you know he's always trying different things too, as like you know supplying energy. So that the ghosts, you know, the old thing where ghosts need energy to manifest or they need to communicate or whatever. Th- those things are the also Frank's in- box. That's, that's what it. I was thinking. Frank's box. Yep. I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, I, you know, all that stuff is so interesting. And, you know, one day, I mean, it. that's not really, if you think about it, Justin, that's not really new because didn't Alexander Graham Bell try to do that? I mean, how many years it's- ago? It's speculated. I've actually yes. recently read articles where it says, you know, even though he had this idea, he didn't really experiment with it. Right. But there are some that say he had schematics for it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I mean, a lot of these people that like Alexander Graham Bell, some I, I believe it was his mother that passed away mm-hmm. or uh Somebody close to him had passed away, and that's why he started researching this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, even 
more recent um um Dan Aykroyd. Oh gosh, his, yes. His mom passed away, but th- their entire family had mm-hmm. been into the paranormal for quite a while and it her passing is kind of what got him even deeper into it and that's mm-hmm. where ghost Bunner, ghost busters mm-hmm. originated you know um absolutely so it's, true it's interesting to think about like what you were saying with alexander graham bell maybe he did and when uh frank some something some sumption was his name mm-hmm. uh maybe he came across that schematic you and was able to pull it off yeah, you never know. But see, that's the thing, though. That's that's kind of my point, that whatever we come across today, um, tech-wise or, you know, any way to, to ghost hunt or uh, explore uh, paranormally, it just seems that they've been trying to do that for decades and hundreds, of, you know, hundred years. I mean, if you go back to the whole spirituality movement, that's where the whole Ouija board thing came from. And you know what? They right. did it in secret, man. It was like, you know, you're going to come to my house for, you know, uh, whatever they called it, cocktails or tea or to, you know, to, to drink cordials or whatever. And they all dressed <laughs> up and they went over there and they kept it all under wraps and then once they all got in it was a big secret they were going to sit around this table and they were going to talk on the spirit board and it that's the whole big movement i mean there's old if if you ever go back and look at old music there's some of the funniest music written about the spirits in the in the air and they all sound very funny now but they were serious then it was an all like an underground movement so it was all very hush hush and taboo but they were getting away with it so it's always had that kind of connotation. And when I was a kid, it was very difficult to get information. You know, we had to go find books. You certainly weren't going to find it on the TV. You weren't going to find it on radio shows, maybe CBS Mystery Theater or something along those lines, which goes mm-hmm. back to what the 60s. But, you know, I literally have memories of going into public libraries and asking for true ghost stories and being told by the librarian there were no such thing as true ghost stories. (laughs) I mean, that's a true story. That's that's a true story. (laughs) So, you know, I've watched it change to where, you know, in my high school years or whatever, when I was having... Um, experiences and stuff you didn't go to school and go guess what happened last night in my living room because people were going to think you were crazy you know right. we're not that far from you know whole towns coming and grabbing you out of your house and burning you at the stake for believing certain things or being different like that so here we are where it's plastered all over the tv it's on a million podcasts it's on your radio it's on the internet it's everywhere and we're just flooded with it so it's like you said it's almost full circle kind you know almost full circle where it's the no- new normal wow yeah wow that's a trip to think about it like that yeah yeah so that's 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 just awesome you know i i'm always interested in asking people how they have viewed things have changed you know, in their lifetimes, in their view, I mean, what is it going to be like, you know, 50 years from now, you know, ghosts and aliens sitting around the coffee table playing poker together, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, quite honestly, I don't think we're going to be any closer 50, 100, 200 years from now for, for an answer than we are right. right now, unless somewhere in the media future, you know, even if this whole uh, full disclosure movement thing makes a crack and all that. Uh, unless aliens come right out and we're, we're like, yeah, we're here. Mm-hmm. You know, let, let, let's let's build towards the future. Um, I think it's going to take something like that to unite this crazy world we live in because mm-hmm. then we will finally have common ground. Makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it'll be kind of an us and them kind of thing then. Right. And that usually is is kind of what it takes because right now it's everything that's different is getting, you know, I've had those conversations within my family before with my son just last week. And I said, look, if it wasn't, if it wasn't, you know, black hair against red hair or brown eyes against blue eyes, it would be something. 
until like right. everybody sees each other as equals and the same, we're always going to have that. And anytime you add anything else different in that, you know, um, even throw in aliens or Bigfoot or anything. I mean, how many times are we just try to track down this poor thing? And what happens if we catch it? If there really is a Bigfoot and we did catch it, it would just wind up in a cage in a zoo like everything else. And wouldn't that be a shame? Uh, you know, that's just or on somebody's dinner plate. Yep. Yep. Bigfoot <laughs> burgers, you know. Bigfoot burgers, you could see, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just strange, but I think you're right about the whole alien thing. If they came here, or at least said we've been here, whichever, then it would kind of be an us and them kind of thing. You know, we'd all have to prove that we weren't aliens, or <laughs> be the only right. Thing. It's, it's be. It's. I don't know that we could ever uh, be unified in that way, but it's a nice thought. Yeah, you know, there's always going to be a difference. I mean, even in the paranormal community, you can see that, you know, where our group does this, our group does this, our group. Does. If we could just everybody get that in all the data and put it together and say, this is what we've got, we might be closer to an answer. But it's almost like a moving target, Justin. You know, the bullseye keeps moving, it seems almost. It's like every time, oh, absolutely. You, every time you uncover it, something, 50 more questions pop up. And that might just be what's so intriguing about it. The mystery, like we said earlier, you know, it just keeps moving. You can never really get a hold of it. So that's probably what keeps everybody going. So now you were talking about writing a book on ghost hunting. How have you been? Are you involved in a group that goes actively ghost hunting now or have you been? Uh, when we first started Night Soccers, we had created our own paranormal investigation team uh it started out with just eric and myself and then it slowly progressed into us bringing on more people so we could actually because we were just doing you know the cemeteries and abandoned houses and that sort of thing and uh we wanted to we wanted to expand we wanted to get it into helping people so we ended up having uh, three guys come on. Uh, one of them left because he was just not able to commit to doing it even part time. And uh, we actually, and this is the feather in our our very short lived paranormal <laughs> investigation cap, is uh, we were part of a group that was the first group to do a paranormal investigation in Jeffrey Dahmer's family home where he filled, killed his first victim. Oh, no. Mm. Yeah. And what did you come away with from that, with that investigation? Did you come away with anything that you felt was solid that convinced you of something going on there? Um. Well, we had one uh, Native American guy who was a medium who said he found, he saw a floating torso. Uh, we had... Eric actually got a halfway decent EVP uh, just before he got the EVP, or maybe it was just after, I can't remember which. He visibly saw a gold orb float, like not picture orb, which is the huge scrutiny of the paranormal community right now, right. but uh, an actual gold orb with his naked eye float by and he was able to correlate the two. Unfortunately, he only got the audio evidence and no, uh, photo or video evidence. Right. Um, trying to think of what else happened there. What did the we EVP were doing? Say? What did the EVP say? Could, could you tell it? Uh, we actually just did a show on this because we want to, we think it said his name. Mm hmm. But it's it's rather low, and it's hard to really tell. It wasn't it wasn't a a class A by any means, okay. but it, it almost sounded like it mimicked his name. Okay. Um, and we were doing a, a ghost box section, actually, what you would call a Radio Shack hack. I don't know if you're familiar with the Radio Shack hack. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had just headphones hooked up to it and then split it off into a digital recorder. Um, probably the biggest mistake I could have made because somebody 
was list somebody else other than myself was listening to it and got and I I honestly don't know how she had heard this, but she heard that there was a journal or a book that Dahmer had left in the house under the floorboards and it got into it, it got to the the client because he was there and he got this bug in his ass because he thought there was this book and he wanted to read the book and come out with a, his own book on owning Jeffrey Dahmer's home and he found this journal and when it came down to it and I listened through the evidence I didn't hear anything that even sounded like journal book anything like that mm-hmm. and the, in my opinion the the ghost the radio shack hack was not a uh, something that you would give as a piece of evidence anyways mm-hmm. so um then we had one of our teammates manipulate a picture so much that he felt that there was a portal in the mirror that he had taken a picture of and it's like Dude, if you take a picture of a mirror, it caught your flash, and you just manipulated <laughs> it so much that, yeah, it looks like a portal. Um, and this was actually a guy we ended up letting go because he was just very unprofessional. Mm-hmm. Um, but nothing too definitive. Mm-hmm. I had something touch me. Um, we were doing that that Radio Shack hack uh and and I had said, you know, are you here? And the gal said she heard yes. And I said, oh, okay, prove it. And I felt this. It wasn't it. It wasn't even a touch. It was like a light caress on my neck, oh. almost like you would touch somebody that you were wanting to be romantic with. I'm like, oh, right. yuck. Yes. So yes, yes. I'm like, yeah, I just got touched. Uh, I need a minute. I'm going outside. Right. So we we had a couple personal um, experiences. We had the one EVP from Eric's side. I don't remember if anybody else caught any EVPs or anything, but nothing too drastic. I mean, you would think with a gruesome situation like that, right. there would have been loads of evidence. But, I mean, there was heaviness, you know, and you know what happened there. So there's the creep factor to begin with. Right. But there was nothing that I could say 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was, there was explain the touch then there was nobody around you. Correct. Right. I I can't. Right. See, so you have that, you have that, you know, there was, there was, I mean, we brought those couple of things to the client, but like when I, when I think of, you know, slam dunk. It's the class EVPs. We caught stuff on video. We caught stuff in pictures. But you make a very good point. We did catch something. Right, right. Well, see, that's the thing. You know, uh, they say basically if you're going to do an investigation, a thorough investigation, you certainly can't do what You know, like, I hate to bring up paranormal reality TV again, but basically people don't realize that some of these groups go in there. They're in there for like two hours and that's it. You know, they have a beat, an A team that goes in, sets everything up, and then they have to be. It's just you can't do it in that amount of time because if you do have an intelligent haunting and it understands what you're doing and it's it's evasive in any way, it's just going to stand back and go, look at these goons. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm certainly not going to, you know... Um, If I'm trying to make the homeowners, if you are in that situation that an entity is intelligent enough and lower vibrational enough to where it's trying to cause trauma, all it has to do to cause more is not do anything because they can't prove that there's anything there. Um, You would have to stay a while, you know, and go through. It had so many different factors in this. There's energy. What are you dealing with? Is there really something there? Is it residual? Is it active? Is it? Does it really have anything to do with that house? Is it a person there? That's why there's so many levels to this. You know, I mean, look at um, the Enfield pol- poltergeist for Pete's sake. There was had nothing to do mm-hmm. with um, a ghostly haunting there. That was it was coming from the the 
the children. It was more of a psychokinesis kind of thing, you know, or, but there's so many things to this, you know, mental illness. Could it be something that they're just imagining? So yeah, I can imagine it would take time that you, you know, to go in there several different times, probably different days, you know, over a, a series of time to get a thorough investigation. So the amount of time that you were in there, that seems like a lot of evidence to me, certainly more than most of these shows or, you know, as some of the other right. people get, you know. I mean, unfortunately, we didn't get a couple days. We d actually did get, um, I want to say we were there for eight hours. Yeah, see, that's a good long time. Yeah. I mean, um, that, and you brought up the Enfield Poltergeist. On Paratruth Radio, we actually got to interview the guy that had done that case yep. before the the uh, uh, Warrens got there. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he is thoroughly convinced that it, it was more than... I mean, when most people think of poltergeist... Mm -hmm. I, I personally think that it, it has to do with kind of like you're saying it's a psychokinesis type deal where you think it's a spirit, but it's a uh, passive aggressive m mental ability that that's coming out from and it usually or originates from a young girl, mm -hmm. which is kind of odd because w girls are going through huge changes at the point of when when this poltergeist stuff is supposedly going on so it's like okay so not only is their body going through changes but their 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 mental abilities are going through changes as well At the same time yeah absolutely yeah yeah but it can also be an angry ghost or a noisy ghost as it comes from german you know right uh, whatever's in geist but it, it, and that's the hard part you know, I did a show a little bit just kind of like what you're talking about, but I was talking more about the, um, oh gosh, what's the name of it? The one that Price did in England. Um, it was a church. Oh gosh, it starts with a B and I lost the name. But basically, they were able to say this was more of a poltergeist being an angry ghost, noisy, throwing things, the ability to manipulate items, apporting um, destruction, things like that, because each family that was there was there for a short time and left and the same activity continued and it did not follow them. So basically price was looking at the whole thing and going, okay, we don't have, um, this telekinesis kind of thing. And of course that, you know, what we're talking back in the 1930, late twenties, early thirties here, they were already starting to understand that that could be a separate thing, you know, um, and that's hard to pull apart, you know. So for an investigator, any investigating group that goes in there, you hear it time and time again where they say that first they have to sit down with the family. Hans Holzer did that, you know, and he'd go sit with the, fa the family. I want to know the history. I want to talk to each individual here. I want to know if there's a kind of mental illness going on or if it's something else going on before he even brought in his medium and uh, did channeling to try to talk to a spirit that was there or whatever. And that was early 60s. So it, it does seem to we're doing the same things, it seems, with the same type of stuff going on, better equipment, more knowledge a wider spread view because more people are talking about it. So we're getting a lot of different points of view thrown in and a lot of people collecting data. I think the only problem is, is we don't have a lot of, um, it's that whole unity thing. It's like, you know, put the data up because we've almost out teched ourselves, Justin, you know, it's like how many times have you saw a video and thought, man, I want that to be true, but I can't look right. at it and say it's true because I just watched Godzilla destroy New York, and it looked real to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, and that's the that's the thing too is um, <laughs> I've speculated with Eric. You know, Jesus could come down right now, yep. and people would be like, "Nah, man, that that was faked. That was green screen. You don't, yeah. you can't say that that was true. It's a hologram." Yeah. 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 It's that's it. We have at text ourselves. So now what? 
you know, because we could be looking at it. I've said it time and time again, I could look at 10 pictures of a full bodied apparition. And I know, I, I understand there's things that you can do. There's, you know, there's very smart people out there that can go through that and look at pixels and tell whether things have been photoshopped or not. I realize that there's, there's uh, lots of, you know, tech that can be used to debunk or prove, but mm. you're still looking at these things and you're going, which if there's one that's true, I can't tell you which one, unless I took the picture myself. And I personally have what I think are fantastic pictures. I wasn't trying to get anything. It just happened. I can't explain it, but I know I didn't fake it. Do you know right. what I'm saying? Well, and that's when you that's when you get some of the best pictures mm -hmm. when you're not doing anything, you're just taking pictures. Yes, exactly. And I know I didn't fake it. I know there wasn't a reflection. I've got this great picture. I was in Gettysburg and um I defy you to go to Gettysburg and not have something happen. I'm just saying. You know, I mean it's amazing, you know, there and it's sad at the same time. But I was taking a picture of something else and it was across the wheat field and it was just before it was really starting to get dark. And it was Halloween night, which was amazing. And I have this, I took six pictures. I basically stood in one section and I wanted to kind of remember where I was. I wasn't trying to get anything. And I just took a picture and I turned and took a picture and turned. And I kept doing that. I did about seven pictures in a circle because I wanted to be able to bring the pictures home and show my husband what the wheat field looked like, you know, and tell mm -hmm. the story. And I come back and I'm looking through the pictures, you know, and I've got wheat field, grass, fence, yada, yada, yada. And then as I took a shot across the whole wheat field, there was this thick pink, pink, like almost like a, not a Pepto-Bismol pink, more like a hot pink <laughs> mist that just covered the whole field. You could see it was thicker in some space, in some places, just like if you were, say, you had maybe six people standing together smoking cigarettes. They all blew out smoke and you put a pink filter in front of it, you know, a, okay. a, a, like a rock and roll light gel or something. That's exactly what it looked like. I'm going, what is this? And I look at the next picture, which is kind of half of that and half of my turn, and there's nothing. It's completely fine again. I can't explain that. And I know you know, that I wasn't drinking, you know, hot beverage that was smoking up and then for some reason put a pink filter over it or something. I know what I did. There was no lights, you know, so I can't explain that, you know, so you'll have... Well, it's actually funny you bring that up. We had an investigation that we did at a, uh, it was in the Cuyahoga community uh, park system and it, uh, they call it Indigo Lake and it was a site of a huge Native American massacre. And um, we there was supposedly a spirit there called the Wraith. And we went there um, and ended up getting a picture of a green mist. Mm -hmm. And there was no fog. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no mist of any kind. Nobody was smoking. You know, mm -hmm. we took... Several pictures, first picture, nothing, second picture, green mist, third picture, nothing again. Exactly. And we could not recreate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what happened to me. But in my case, I took seven. It was nothing in the one before it, nothing in the one after it. That's It's incredible. And I had never heard in all my time. I've been looking into this since I was, what, 10. That's, you know, that's a long time. That's 40 plus years. And I mean, at least interested in it. And I've never heard, I've heard of colored orbs, you know, and I know we've got the white mist, the black mist, the dark gray mist. I never heard of colored mist other than green fogs rolling, like you said. Um, I've heard a lot of that. I just, uh, pink mist out of nowhere, you know. Um, and then you start looking on the internet thinking, okay, what would that mean? And somebody apparently has this book, you know, the book of rules that nobody else can see. Do you know that book that every, the elusive book of rules where like demons can only do this and certain ghosts can only do this and you know, the book of rules that nobody's ever seen. And they have all these colored uh, orbs and what they mean. Now, who, oh, wrote, okay. who wrote this thing? I, I honestly am not familiar with it. So I'm not even sure. Look into it. Look into it and start looking through these things. It's like colored orbs mean this because it basically goes on energy. And I guess it has, it's based on aura. 
if you if you understand anything about auras and the different color right. auras, what they mean. So obviously those auras are energy. So why wouldn't if a ghost or an entity is energy, why wouldn't it be the same color? Like, of course, red or black is going to be negative or angry. And I'm thinking, how do we know this? You know, I mean, it's like you just really never know what to believe and what not to believe. You want it to make sense and you're looking for things that make sense and then based on scientific or what you're seeing yourself. But you and I had a conversation the other day and like you just said, Jesus himself could come down and people get now green screen, you know, that's a hologram. If we're talking to people, how do we know we're talking to who we're talking to? do you see what you know that you that made us a lot of sense when you said that because i've always said that about ouija boards you know people you could be sitting in front of somebody and they could be lying their face off you know and it just depends on how good a liar they are and how gullible you are whether or not you're going to believe it or not why do right. you think a spirit isn't going to lie to you or whatever right. is moving well, the board th- that's i mean that goes the same for mediums and psychics as well now as I told you, I'm a sensitive. Mm-hmm. Now, I can, I cannot tell you if what I'm sensing is a demon or a human spirit or maybe it's a, a jinn or, or any other type of mm-hmm. spiritual energy other than what it is. So, I mean, it, a lot of mediums get uptight when you ask them, how do you know that that's a human spirit or how do you know that's uncle Jimmy and not something else? Telling and it's, it's like, Jimmy. You're right. It's and uncle it's Jimmy. like, I get you. If, if it's a trickster trickster type spirit, whether it's a, a, a demon or a gin or even a trickster, uh, you don't know. I right. mean, yeah, I, I do believe mediums have the gift to contact dead relatives. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, but you can't sit there and say definitively that that is Uncle Jimmy that's coming through right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I understand where you're coming from. I absolutely do because I've asked the same questions. The answers that I've collected over the years that kind of give me a little more comfort and what I've learned from my own experience, however, you know, do I doubt my own experiences in some way or another and question them? Absolutely. You know, because you're always questioning everything. Um, But open-mindedly, I'm thinking, okay, it makes a lot of sense for, uh, I know from my own experience, if I can feel something negative coming towards me, just feeling it. How do I explain that? Ah, I can't. It's more of a lower vibrational, it resonates on a lower vibrational uh, frequency. Mm -hmm. If it's something that's lighter, and happy and um you know more jovial that kind of thing it's on a higher frequency and then it definitely resonates different just the same as music feels if it's at a low angry uh beat as well as a a happy song that's the only way i can explain it plus there's extra sensories that go off in me um my, the hair will stand up on the back of my neck and my arms in a different way. I'll get the feeling different in different parts of me. Say, if mm-hmm. it's really negative, I'll get that heavy press on my chest. That okay. doesn't mean that it's evil. It depends on how everything comes together. Um, it could just be sad and depressed. It could be upset, angry. Okay? Um, mm-hmm. And I feel, it seems that I feel differently... If it's something that is here, uh, let's just say human-wise, a ghost that's stuck and confused, say if I walk on a battlefield, something like that, very heavy, oppressive. Okay. And that's different, a different frequency, a different vibration than if it's something um, in a case of something that's already lifted itself or say crossed over or been into the light and come to visit a loved one it just feels different it feels different before they ever start speaking it feels different now could that be you bring up an interesting point what if and we don't know it is something that has the intelligence 
like say a gin or um something of that ilk the trickster something we don't even know about don't have a name for that has right. the ability to change their frequency do you see what i'm saying so if, if it knows that and it comes in why couldn't it change its frequency to a higher vibra- higher vibration so it comes in kind of Oh, I'm happy. I, I'm Aunt, you know, I'm Aunt Jane, and I just came here to tell everybody I'm fine and I'm loved. Why couldn't it change its frequency? I don't know that it can't, but I can tell right. you how I feel. I can't prove it. You see what I'm saying? And then we also say, well, they'll come in and they'll say it give you information that that medium might never know. Like a good medium or good psychic reading to me would be okay. Your mom is here. She says that, and I can't do this. I'm not saying I can, but I'm just saying people that do. (laughs) Right. Your mom is here, and she says she's fine. She knows you were thinking of her because you were, a a few days ago, you you bought a new blue dress, and you were dancing around in the living room. That song came on, and you thought of her because you guys used to sing that song together. Whoa. That's intense. But... That's going to convince you that that's your mom coming through and she saw you dancing that blue dress because you were the only one in the room. The medium doesn't know that. But why wouldn't a trickster know that? Right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I get it, but I know really good mediums and really good psychics that I can understand why they get. They'll say, I've been doing this for 35 years and I know. And I get that, and I believe that because I understand what they're saying about the feelings and the vibrations and everything else. I totally get that, but I also get what you're saying, if that makes sense. Well, and I'm not saying that mediums aren't talking to to, to dead loved ones, like I said, mm-hmm. but you. That's why Eric and I have meshed so well because mm-hmm. he he has that Christian belief that all spirits or or whatever it is are demons Mm -hmm. and he has come around to the point where he can admit that he doesn't know for sure Mm -hmm. maybe maybe there are human spirits that can come come Mm -hmm. back or end up staying here or whatever where i'm the opposite i feel that human spirits can end up being trapped here or come back after they've passed on through the light but i'm not I, I'm not that close minded to say that, Eric, you're wrong. All of these things are not demons. We don't know. Yeah. Well, that's we just exactly, don't know. And that's exactly what I'm saying, Justin. We, we, we don't know. We can hope. Now, we can take years and years of, you know, and again, I'm one of those people that say, if somebody says they're a paranormal expert on, I can see you being an expert on a certain. Uh, fragment of the paranormal yeah onion whatever you want to call it <laughs> but even that is like hmm, expert i like the people that come in and say and i've heard rosemary ellen guiley say this which is why I, you know she gained some respect for me and i she is an excellent writer and she's been around a long time but i loved her even more when she said you know when i came out with this book and i said this this and this well i've learned some things since then that changed my mind and i was wrong i love that because i can't say that tomorrow i won't learn something that tells me today I, I, I was mistaken about something because right. that's this subject and we're only going to learn by talking to each other and being honest with each other and saying, this is what I think. What do you think? And show me why you think that and keeping an open mind. And I think that's cool. And that's one of the reasons I had you asked you on this show because I listened to your show and I know you do that. And I think that's awesome because you know, I there's certain things, man, that I can say probably 95% I'm going to go, ah, I don't know, you know. And then there's some <laughs> yeah. things that I'm just going to go, right now I know this. This is what I've come to after all these years of looking at it. But what do you got on the subject? I'm willing to listen. Tell me what you think and why you think it and let me go research it and let me see if it changes my mind. And that's one of the last questions I wanted to ask you is in all the years you've been doing this and looking into it, 
going into, I don't know what started your interest, um, how early it was, was it, were you a child? We're just like everybody else. We were just interested in the ghost stories and stuff, but yeah, when I first got started, um, I was, I, I was in fifth grade when I remember getting a book about Loch Ness Monster. And I actually had, I had read through it and I was talking to my fifth grade teacher about it. And he was one of the first people to be like, okay, just because it's on paper doesn't mean it's true. Because I I was a believer. Uh I believed that Loch Ness was real. Uh And at first I got really angry. It's like, how dare you question what I believe? But after, you know, thinking about it a lot, I, I've come to the conclusion that he was trying to encourage me to be a free thinker. Yeah. 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 That's cool. That's a cool story. And it holds a lot of water too, because each kid grabbed a book and, you know, how many books, you know, Bermuda Triangle or, you know, Chariots of the Gods or whatever that we were looking through and reading and look at the pictures and trying to figure out what in the world was going on, you know, with me very early, like I said, at Hans Holzler. And that's a great way for him to do that and say, you know, that might have been the seed that planted you to have an open mind on this. That's very cool. Now, the question is, How have your going in and believing what you started to believe and then going through all of this, how have your views changed on it? What was the biggest switch for you in believing in the paranormal in any way, you know, whether it be cryptids or ghosts or demons or whatever, what was your biggest, the thing that shocked you like, man, and, and you changed your mind on it. What was that? Uh, I, I think the the biggest thing that happened for me is when we were doing Night Stalkers. And we, at that point, I, I felt I was an atheist. I didn't believe that there was a God or any anything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, talking through stuff and I, I came to this epiphany because for, for whatever reason, I believed in ghosts, but I didn't believe in God or angels and demons. Mm-hmm. And I came to this epiphany and I'm like, okay, well, if I believe ghosts are real, Mm -hmm. then why aren't, why, why don't I believe in God or why don't I believe that angels and demons exist? Mm -hmm. And I think that was the epiphany point for me because, and that that's kind of what led me to, to study Christianity again is, uh, realizing, okay, I mean, First and foremost, how can you believe in ghosts and not something high higher? Mm-hmm. And it's like uh, looking through how wonderful and beautiful, even though this world is completely messed up, mm-hmm. uh, how wonderful and beautiful the world and the universe is to think that it's just a random chance of, mm-hmm. of events. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's where it kind of changed for me. And, you know, I've had numerous guests on throughout the, the shows that I've done. And I don't know. I mean, some of them are just way out there and I, I cannot see their point of view. Mm-hmm. And then there's some that make me question and it's like, okay, maybe, maybe they do know something more than what, what I believe in. So mm-hmm. that's a, that's a pretty uh, good change. I mean, to come, come through that. That's, that's awesome. And I'm glad you did that. I think asking you that question has made me think about it too. Um, I kind of always knew, you know, like sometimes I know that I know that there's gotta be an injury. Something's gotta have the wheel. I don't know who it is, you know, um, it just doesn't make sense. And I really honestly believe, Justin, that we're not the only ones. And I really think it's all connected. Somehow, man, it is all connected. There's a big picture here. You know, um, I don't know if you know Zariah, but he said one time, you know, it's like you have, we have all these pieces to a puzzle and we're not really even sure how many pieces there are to that puzzle 
so basically we're not even sure what the piece we're holding you know even is you know mm. let alone what the big picture is but somehow right. it seems like it's all connected whether it's you know aliens and other planets and um other dimensions other you know all this stuff but if you really stand back away from it and go why not it all seems to go snap, 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 you know, energy, you know, energy for whatever reason, um, you know, and believe in that we've got it within us as well, you know, and free choice and all that. But that's what it's all about is you have free will to believe or not to believe. And how do you know also that we're only going to understand what we're supposed to understand at this point in our lives? You know, I've heard that theory before, and that made a lot of sense, too. Um, yeah. Other people are supposed to take other paths, and that may be for a reason. I don't know. There's one of those things I'm going to say, I don't know. But I'm certainly <laughs> out there looking and talking to really interesting people and trying to get their views, and I think that's what's so awesome about the podcast. And there's so many out there. Um, maybe now we'll all start talking to each other and more importantly, maybe we'll start listening. So, well, like we had talked before starting recording, you, you know, we've made some really great friends doing paratruth radio. And that is how I ended up with beyond reason because I ended up inheriting it from somebody who inherited it from the guys that started it in 1987 on terrestrial radio. Mm -hmm. uh, it's getting those connections and making yourself known as well as, I mean, there are so many people to just podcast hosts alone that to hash the stuff out with even not, even just not paranormal, but like any type of uh, genre or, or specific topic that's out there i mean i listen to comedy podcasts mm -hmm. i've listened to you know ghost story like ghost stories people telling ghost stories mm -hmm. and it's just amazing what some of these people do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely and it's not just when i was growing up it was three channels on the tv and your library yeah. and you know and if you were lucky you got a really cool radio show or something like like i said mystery theater or something a talk radio that people were talking about this or anything you know for that matter like you said mysteries or comedy or whatever now it's every genre has so many different ones so we are getting to talk to each other. We are getting the word out there. And like your teacher said to you, just because we're saying it doesn't make it true, just because it's on paper doesn't make it true. But we can at least talk it out. We can say why we believe what we believe. And like I said earlier, you tell me what you've got. Let's put it together. See if it fits because you might have that piece of puzzle that snaps with mine and we can go, hey, wait. You know, this does make a little sense. Let's look into this. And that's just so cool because we're talking. And that's one of the reasons I did this podcast. I want people to be able to come on here and say what happened to them. And they're looking for answers. And I can't tell you. I'm sure you get the same thing. People call. People write. People send you emails. And mm -hmm. something there's something in within that episode clicked with them, you know. And I just, oh, man, that's just so cool. You know, uh, yeah. it's just, it's, it's amazing that we can sit here within our homes or offices or what, wherever you're doing your podcast or your show from and connect with people like that. It's just, oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's a mind blower. You know, you can write a book, yeah. you can write a book and hope that people read it and connect with it. But this is almost an instantaneous kind of thing and that's just and it's going to be out there for a while just like a book too so people pick up on it so i know you've got so much to do and i cannot thank you enough for coming on here and you know it's so interesting it took so many different turns that i wasn't expecting it to take but it was a lovely <laughs> lovely journey on this side of the gate lovely walk with you on the side um, can you tell us again where to find you and tell us again where to get your book and everything and when the next one's coming out? Yeah, uh, 
paratruthradio.com, uh, okay. beyondreason.net. That's the two podcasts. And justincancellary.com is where they can find my author stuff. Mm-hmm. I've got several of my short stories up there and where you can buy the book. Uh, it's on Amazon right now. And you can get it through any uh, ebook uh, reader or whatever that's out there. It, you can get it on Kindle or uh, what Nook is the Barnes and Noble one, as well as any of the other ones out there. So uh, definitely look for the legendary creature project, the Griffin and book two, which is the worm will be coming out uh, fairly soon. I hope I'm still working on the first draft of it. So definitely keep an eye out for that as well. And like I said, uh, Eric and myself are going to start working on a nonfiction ghost hunting book. So fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I I've just enjoyed this conversation so much. Thank you for coming on. And I hope this won't be the uh, last time you're, you're on this show. Whenever you want me on, just let me know. Absolutely. If you get any more pieces of that puzzle, man, you'll let me know, right? Absolutely. And same for any guests. You just let me know and I will get you their information. Oh, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Have a good evening. (laughs) No problem. You too. Okay, dear listeners. Thank you so much to Justin for coming in and giving us his views. Uh, What a lovely conversation. Uh, He's becoming a very good friend, and I appreciate him being on this side of the gate tonight, and I thank you for listening. I have some uh, interesting information. I'm excited about it. Uh, We now have Journey Through the Gate Paranormal Portal Podcast Swag. Yep, that's right. We've got swag. You look in there. It's going to be in tpublic.com slash Cisco. You go in and you find my design page. You can find all of this on our Facebook page on a Journey Through the Gate Paranormal Portal Podcast Gatekeepers. Just pop in there. If you're not a member yet, come on in. Send me a member request. You'll be right in there and you can see all the different. Uh, we've got T, you know, the the normal roundabout. We've got T-shirts. We've got baseball tees. We've got um, the... Uh, sleeveless tees we've got kids uh t-shirts onesies no the onesies do not come in adult size i'm sorry to tell you that um we have that the mugs travel mugs some really cool spiral notebooks and canvas notebooks like um and you can get that with the ruled paper or just the plain paper if you're an artist uh so what we've decided to do is take a lot of our cool cover art. You know that Crispy's always in there. That's our mascot, little Crispy the ghost. And he's always up to something. Crispy's in and out of everything. Um, and in through <laughs> in and out and through everything. So um, we've done a lot of the cover art on there. Um, we've got our cool monsters on, uh, line up, the usual suspects. And then we've got, of course, our logo stuff as well. And a small portion of that goes to keep this podcast on because it does cost to load everything up and get the RSS feed out there and keep it on Libsyn and get it on iTunes. So that helps a little bit. So that's your way you can help support this show. And I certainly do appreciate it. And the number one way you that you support this show is just by listening. And I hope you enjoy, uh, find episodes that you enjoy. We appreciate it. Uh, pass it along if you can. We certainly appreciate every si- single bit of that and every single listener that's out there. Um, also, if you have your own stories, journey through the gate at gmail.com. Send me your stories. We are doing a compile of listener stories that I will be reading, and some people will be coming in to say their own. So please uh, let us know that way. Or on the Gatekeepers page as well. You can find us there on Facebook, Twitter, all the normal stuff, and you can find the podcast on all the podcatchers. So we really appreciate you being there. I thank you. I love each and every one of my guests that come on and all of you have sent so many wonderful comments to us. We're really reaching out to a lot of people. We try to get you different stuff and different stories. And that's, you know, that's just why we're here to connect with you and for you to connect with others and uh, learn about this wonderful subject, uh, the paranormal and the supernatural. So it's, it's just fantastic being here. And I just feel honored that, uh, you're enjoying this podcast and I, I enjoy hearing 
all the different things that uh, you have to say as well. So thank you for that. Now, the major thing that you've got to do is keep your feet under those covers. Keep your closet door shut.